to the Declaration of Independence. But uh, I was doing a little reading, and I found this essay, and I'm just going to share a, little, a few brief things from it, about the people who signed the Declaration of Independence. There's 56 names that appear in the bottom. Obviously, Jan, John Hancock shows, uh, shows up largest. He wanted to write it, write it large enough so even King George could see it, and he made his signature extra large. But uh, here's some things about these, these folks who wrote it. Five of them were captured by the British. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost sons live, serving in the Revolution Army. Another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and, uh, 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 in some fashion and had hardships in the Revolutionary War. Uh, and then there were uh, several that lost a lot. For instance, uh, a man named Carter Braxton from Virginia. He was a wealthy planter and a trader. He had ships that would, he was in the shipping business as well. The, the British confiscated all of his ships on the high seas. He had to sell his home and property, pay his debts, and died in poverty. Um, various soldiers looted the profits of the, these are the signers, had the properties looted, Dillery, Hall, Clymer, Walton, Gwinnett, Hayward, Rutledge, and Middleton. And the, the, the most amazing story of this whole essay, a man named Thomas Nelson, Jr., during the Battle of Yorktown, so this is very near the end of the, the war, uh, he noted from a distance that uh, the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. So the enemy's in his home. He goes quietly to George Washington and asks him to open fire. Home was destroyed. He died bankrupt. Now there's a line in the Declaration of Independence that says this. It says this. For the support of this declaration, with firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we mutually pledged each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. We do. We do stand on the shoulders of giants that went before us. Now, I want to take you to a story of a lady who risked everything to make sure her people were safe, to be saved from a, a, a holocaust of un, unimaginable uh, parameters. So if you're in Exodus, or excuse me, Esther chapter 4, we're going to look at the story of this lady. Now, uh, there's a lot in this story that I do not have time to recount to you. Uh, I would encourage you, the great news is you can read the story for yourself on your own time. Hey, isn't that a great idea? I'm glad I just thought of that. Why don't you read that on your own time sometime today? It won't take long. It's not a long read. But basically, here's what happens. This is about 480 years or so before the time of Christ. It's uh, toward the end of what we call the Babylonian captivity. And now what happens, the Babylonians come in and take Judea and basically export most of the people and they're living in exile in a foreign land. After a while, the Babylonians are overtaken by the Persians. So it becomes now they're living in exile in the Persian Empire. The king that's on the scene, as you see in the beginning of this book, is a man named Ahasuerus. And uh, he has a queen that, he, uh, falls, that she falls out of favor with him. And she has deposed his queen. So he has this, how should we say it, this contest to select a new queen. Okay? So all these women are brought in and they're all you know, uh, beautified and all that sort of thing. And finally, this lady whom we know in text of Scripture, whose name was Hadassah, later has her name changed to Esther, uh, was selected to be part of this process. And finally, through the providence, providence of God, she becomes the queen over this whole land. Okay? So there's a man also known, known as Haman that factors into the story. And Haman and Mordecai, Mordecai is Esther's relative, and uh, uh, they were Jewish, obviously. And uh, because of some intrigue, Haman is trying to assert his authority and rise and influence in this Persian kingdom. And the one person he really hates is Mordecai. And you can read about what the hatred's all about and that sort of thing. So he manipulates the king into signing a, 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 a command, if you will, that on a certain date, and, and Haman interestingly cast lots to determine, according to his gods, what would be the most favorable date for this slaughter of the Jews to take place. And by the way, the lot was called Pur, or Pur, in their language, and that's why Jews still celebrate the Feast of Purim in about March in, of each year to celebrate this deliverance through the hand of Esther. So uh, this, this goes on, and finally, so he signs this, and, and the law of the Persians cannot be altered. Once he signed it, it's got to happen. So Mordecai finds out about it, and uh, he goes to Esther to appeal to her, would you go and to appeal to the king to do something to, so that we are not saved, so we would be saved and we would not be slaughtered? 
And we enter in chapter 4 a bit of the discussion about what she's going to do. And if you look in chapter 4, if you look at verse 8, you'll see it there. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him and for her people. Obviously, we have someone in a position of power and influence. She can get the king's ear. She can appeal for us. So, Esther, you need to go and do that. Now, Mordecai can't just go in wherever Esther is, so they're sending messages back and forth, so you kind of get that. So, Hatat returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai, and Esther spoke to Hatat and gave him the command for Mordecai. So, this is going back and forth. Verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, except has one except called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these thirty days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. So here's her dilemma. First of all, he has no idea that his wife is a Jew, okay? Uh, I don't think he really has much of an idea that what he signed was to destroy all the Jews. That was just sort of out of his mind. And uh, Esther has a problem. If she just goes waltzing into the king's presence without being summoned, the law was if you came in uninvited, you would be killed on the spot, except the king could make an exception. He grabbed his scepter and hold it up, and everyone knew that was a sign. Okay, you pass the test. So she has no guarantee she's even going to talk to the king, no guarantee she's even going to survive going into the king. She also knows about what happened to the last queen. Okay, so all this suddenly flows through her mind. What is she going to do? Well, I want to just share with you this simple reality, that she does take a, tr- take a risk for the truth. And God calls us to take a risk for the truth. And as believers, followers of Jesus Christ, that is a very solemn, very important, and sometimes very scary thing to think about. But may we, as those people who wrote and signed the Declaration of Independence, may we on our sacred honor say we're willing to risk what we whatever we have, whatever it is for God's kingdom and for God's glory. So I want to just think with you just briefly about how she may have processed this whole whether she's going to go in or not. And it's a similar process that you and I may go through when we're considering if we're going to be risk takers for the cause of Christ. Are we going to be public? Are we going to be out there? Are we going to be people that we want them to know that we're followers of Christ? that we want them to identify us as that, and we're willing to take whatever that may mean because of how they look at us. And you understand, we live in a world that seems, in our culture anyway, the world's always been evil, but in our culture here in America, it becomes more and more less, uh, how should we say, in, hip, or cool to be a follower of Christ. I uh, saw something that someone sent me, the other, actually posted online and sent to me individually, uh, about someone... Uh, famous, rather famous anyway, in, in, in the public eye, proclaiming, and they, this was basically their quote, I was raised in church, I was raised to believe in God, but now I'm an atheist, and the whole crowd in front of this person just cheered, like, you know, we're so glad that you got to the place that you do not believe in God, and we're so glad, glad that you've been freed from the tyranny of religion, and so glad that you finally figured out the truth, and people are cheering, and they're perfectly, you know, see this person smiling, it's just like, how awful that we as a culture have got to the point that we cheer for those that reject the God who made us all, the God before whom we all will stand someday. But we understand that. So are we going to be willing to take this risk? So let's think with me, think with me, if you will, as we calculate our actions. And may we calculate our actions always based on truth, God's truth, not our feelings, not the circumstances, not the, how much it could impact us, but the truth is the basis upon which we behave in a hostile world. Okay, so she's made her appeal. And uh, verse 12, So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the Jews. I'm telling you what, Mordecai is making his case, isn't he? He, he's, He's putting the pressure on. And not just to manipulate her, because this is serious. This is life or death we're talking about. And he says in verse 14, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. In other words, there's there's an underlying belief that God can save us whether you're involved in the process or not. 
but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is the time. Now is the time. So what is she going to do? Well, most of us know the rest of the story, so I'm not going to worry too much about it. Spoilers. But I want to process this particular time frame as best we can, all right? So here's her dilemma. She can either keep quiet or speak up. I can either make this attempt to go into the king and make my appeal, or I can just keep quiet and hope for the best. Now, Mordecai has already kind of poked a hole in that theory, according to him. Don't think that just because you're being quiet it's going to matter. Don't think that's going to spare you. And basically what this edict said was, on that particular date when it came about, anyone in all of Persia can go out and kill with abandon any Jew, slaughter them, and you can take all their possessions. You, they, they, are, they have no legal protections. They have no legal right. You have the right, the, the, in fact, you're urged to go on this murderous spree and enrich yourself by taking and plundering all that has left. I say this as a side note. Don't ever overlook the fact in Scripture or in history how hated the Jews are on this planet. We see it by what's going on with Hamas and the battle going raging in Gaza after all these months since October, the absolute horror that took place back in October in Israel. What's taken place is on the streets of the United States, taken place on the college campuses in our America. That is not an emotional reaction. That is not a political statement. That is spiritual warfare inspired by Satan himself. Because these people, of all the people of the earth, were selected to be God's treasure. God's special people made a special covenant with them. And for us who are non-Jews, we have the blessing that through that people has come the one and only Savior of all, time, of all time. So that hatred that you see here 400 years before Jesus, that we see right now in our country, a country that's built on freedom of religion, and we, we you know, no, there's no, no religion is imposed on us by the state and that sort of thing, and, and we should, maybe we don't agree with everybody's faith, but we, we all have a right to believe, and we, we do, that's one of the tenets. And now to be persecuting people, it's just, it's unimaginable to me. But you know it to be true. So this is a, this is a, a Satan and satanically inspired thing. So what is she going to do? Am I going to keep quiet or am I going to speak the truth? There's a phrase that's found in Romans chapter 3. It's just a little phrase of a verse, and I just love it, where he says, God, where Paul says this, Let God be true and every man a liar. By the way, that's an accurate statement. Everything God says is true, has been true, will be true, and not one of us has spoken the truth in entirety throughout our lifetime. We all have, we are all woefully deficient in that particular parameter. So God be true. So we need to understand, as she needed to understand at this moment, that I'm gonna, am I gonna base this on truth, how I order my life, what I, how I present myself to the world, how I communicate with others, how I, uh, just whether I'm public or not about our faith. And sometimes we're in settings where it's like, is it safe to let someone know that I'm a follower of the Lord. Now, uh, Joe and I had a meeting uh, we had to take care of earlier this week, and we're downtown in, a, uh, in one of our fabulous high-rise buildings here in Charleston, let's just say it that way, and we had this meeting, and with this particular person we were meeting with, obviously we're, we're coming representing a church and I'm a pastor, so you know, I, I couldn't keep some things quiet, and we exchanged business cards, and it says Mount Calvary Baptist Church on the card, so I mean, there was no secret. But, uh, and I don't know if this lady is a believer or not. I don't know anything about her, met her for the first time we're meeting with. But you know what? I wanted to make sure somewhere in this conversation, I wanted to say something to let her know that I'm a follower of Christ. That's it. And the Lord gave us that opportunity. We were looking at this thing and we're wondering how it's going to go. And I just said, you know what? We're believers. We believe in the Lord Jesus and we're trusting Him to lead us through this whole thing. Make a point, make an effort, set it as your goal to be public about your followership of Jesus Christ in every situation you're in. Whether you're on the ball field, whether you're in the classroom, whether you're in, talking to the person in the cubicle next to you, whether it's in your business, your employers, or your employer, your neighbors, find some way to be public about your faith. Because God wants us to not be quiet. He wants us to speak up. Now, we also need to teach this to our children. Because our children are growing up in a world if you're my age, they're growing up in a world that you and I, if you're my age, could scarcely believe they're, they're facing. 
Now, whether, whether, wherever they get this from, whether it's through the media or scrolling on their phone or through the places they go, they're being taught, first of all, they are not a creation of God. You're just some random accident, just an animal, kind of like every other animal. And if you want to act like an animal or you want to identify as an animal, that's okay. That is not the truth. We live in a world where, we, where children are being taught, and particularly this month, we're, we're, we're pushed to say, you know, we need to accept this, this truth. Now, I understand. We love everybody. We love people. We love sinners. But the truth is the truth. The fact is, we may say, we may identify, we may get our pronouns right, but gender is determined by God's creation, not us. But we're, they're pressed with all of this, 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 this thing that's not the truth. Now, uh, we also are pressed with a thing that, that would tell them that, um, that life is not that significant. That this is all there is. Don't, don't live outside of the parameter. Don't live in the parameters of the, of, of the religious, the spiritual, the metaphysical. That this, this is all there is. What we need to tell them is simply this. They are created by God. That God is, is indeed is real and exists. That Jesus is the Savior. That the Bible contains absolute truth. It is not up for review. It is not up for reevaluation. It is the truth, absolute truth. And there is such a thing as absolute truth. And that the Bible is reliable, that heaven is the goal, and we must obey him no matter who tries to bully us to do otherwise. It's our job to teach our children to have a resilience like Esther, and for us to have that same resilience like Esther. Now, how do we, how do we, keep, that in, how do we keep that going? It comes back to us being people who cling to the truth that's described in the Bible. The Bible is true, it's accurate, it's without error, it is sufficient for our lives today. Now, I have a watch on today. I like watches. And this is, this is a favorite watch. There's a whole story about how I got it. I won't bore you with it. Uh, I, had to, I waited about three years to buy this watch. It's a big story about this watch. But for some reason, the little part you pull out to reset the watch, if you pull it out, it just comes all the way out, the stem and everything. Okay? Now you can shove it back in and it stays there, but you can't reset it. All right? So right now it's about two minutes fast and I can't reset it. Okay, I'm still going to end on time and everything. Okay, don't worry about that. But uh, you can't reset it. Now when the battery dies down, I guess I'm going to have to wait till that exact moment in the day and stick the battery in, I guess. I don't know what else to do. It can't be reset. We in our day daily life, we get all battered and beat and pushed around by all kinds of things. And the only thing that resets us back to the reality of the truth of who we are and who we are is to be reset by our exposure to the Word of God. And if we're not resetting, we're going to get a little off, we're going to get a little off, a little off, a little off. And if I let this thing go, if the battery lasts long enough, it's going to be longer than two minutes. It'll be two and a half, it'll be three, and eventually it's get to the point that I can't wear it because the time is so far off. This time we spend together on Sunday mornings is vital. I strongly implore you to get involved in a small group, one of our life groups, because that gives you a whole different setting to counter the Word of God. I encourage you, I implore you, I, I would beg you if I thought it would, happen, if it would help, that you make sure that you spend some time in God's Word every day, that don't let your prayer life down, that we take seriously our faith, because this world in which we are living, as it was at this moment in Esther's life, is no friend of people of faith. It's no friend of the follower of Christ. It's not going to help you and encourage you and keep you reset and directed to the truth. It's going to do everything it can to push you away. Number two, she had to risk public identification versus remaining hidden. Now, she's got to march in there, and when she asks uh, the king, if she survives to get a chance to ask, she's now got to self-identify as a Jew who he's just signed the death warrant to in this decree. What's he going to say? He could easily just say, well... Too bad, too sad. I, got a, I, you know, I, had a, I had a queen contest before. Let's have another one. I mean, it, it, she does not have that, how that's going to go. But she was really to, willing to rest, risk this public identification. I've already covered some of that earlier, but I'll just give you a few thoughts. Uh, be public in your stand for Christ. Let her know you have faith in Christ. Add it to your conversation. We already talked about that. But sometimes when accusations come our way, just accept that as the cost of following Christ. You know, some people will tell us that we are the problem. Now, we have problems, okay? Just, we, we are not perfect. 
hopefully making progress. But, but we, are not what, we are not what is wrong with the world, okay? Uh, we are not the ones who are so narrow and so bigoted and so hateful and so constraining of people that we are poisoning the minds of children because we're putting all this spiritual reality into their hearts. That we are not the problem. The truth is the solution. And when people accuse us of all those sort of things, I remember uh, recently, I, <laughs> again, I will not tell you the story, but I posted something online, just commented on someone's post, very innocent, whatever, and I get this rant back from the same per, from a person who read it. How could you? How could you Christians act that way? And blah, blah, you're, you're, you hate people, and you're whatever. It's like I know my heart. I don't. I don't hate anyone here. I do believe in the truth. I believe there is such a thing as right and wrong. But just because I don't agree with your version of the truth does not mean I hate you. And we could go on and on and on how we are accosted, how we're accused, how we do these things, and we have to come to this place that we need to understand that we need to be public in our faith. Number three, we can either act on our own or seek God's direction and help. Go back to our text this morning. Now he's just told her, if you remain completely silent, verse 14, all that. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. By the way, the whole key to that story is that phrase in the end of verse 14. The whole key to the whole book, by the way. It's where he says, uh, Yet who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. By the way, do you know God wanted you to live in the 21st century? You know how I know that? You know how I can prove that? Because you're living in the 21st century. That's how I can prove that. This, and every age has its different challenges, different realities. Our parents, our grandparents, you know, had different challenges and that sort of thing. But you have to understand, God wanted you to live in this culture with our challenges, our unique thing. And we need to say, for such a time as this, this is our time to be a person who's willing to take a risk in our being public going forward, not being silent, but speaking up for the cause of Christ. Now, we don't need to be hateful about it. We don't need to be obnoxious about it. But we need to positively, sincerely, simply, forcefully declare the truth in every situation we're in. Now, look what she does. Verse 15, Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. So I will go into the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Love that. He says, what I want you to do, your, here's your job. I'll go in, but I want you to be fasting. Now, does, the word prayer is not used there. I think it's certainly strongly implied that's what they're doing as well as fasting. So I don't think that's too big of an assumption. But you go in and you make your appeal before God before me. I want to know that you're beseeching the throne of heaven for me. I want you to know that we all are in this together and they understand what's at stake. And I'm out there, the one that's most exposed at this particular moment to the risk. And she doesn't seek her own direction, but she calls for help from others. How often... Do we live our lives for a short period or sometimes a season where we have just sort of forgotten about God's place in our life? We get sloppy in our time with Him. We, we, church is not that significant to us that we just get to the place. And, you, and you've, you've probably all of us have been there for a brief time or a long time. And you just suddenly realize what a mess this is. What a, what a, what a waste this is. Now, don't beat yourself up if you've had one of those. Just rejoice that you need to take the steps to be where you need to be. And because you can't do anything about yesterday, but you can affect today and you can change the direction for tomorrow as you walk in obedience to our Lord. So she seeks help. And that's why church life is so important. We don't have to do this alone. Uh, we, we have others that can go along with us, encourage us. The fact that you know, when you walk in this door and there's other people, when we're singing these wonderful songs like we sang this morning, uh, I, you know, our voices blending together. It, just, it, it does something that we really can't explain. So make sure that you seek God's direction and God's help. And then listen to input or live in ignorance. Is she going to listen to Mordecai, his input, or am I just going to say, you know what, I can't deal with this, see no evil, hear no evil, you know. I, I'm just going to just, just tune out. I've got a good thing going as queen, you're all on your own, good night. No, that's not what she does. And I love this resolve. I mean, this is the resolve in the end of 16. And if I perish, I perish. I've got to do what's right. Leave the consequences to God. Now, you pray. You fast. My, my team's going to be fasting and praying. We're going to do it this way. And she steps forward in faith. You see, living 
independent of other believers puts us in a, a real deficit. Uh, now, we understand not every input that pretends to be truthful is, but we need to have some discernment. But those that are appropriate, the lovers of the truth, let them speak into your life. And then in the issues of the day, we need to determine, not living in ignorance, but determine what the Bible has to say on these issues. I heard that there was a debate on TV the other night. Did anyone hear about that? I don't, it seems like I heard about that. And uh, so whether you're into politics or not, uh, we're most of us are aware of that. So President Biden and former President Trump spend 90 minutes in Atlanta. And the whole point of the debate, you can judge whether you think it succeeded or not, was to find out what they thought about various issues. And the, uh, the news people asked some questions about various issues. And you, I'm not, you, you can determine what you think of that. And, and that's probably very proper. We want to know what they think about the issues. The issues that came up were the economy, taxation, government spending, that sort of thing. Foreign policy, what about the wars that are going on? How do we relate to that war and peace? Healthcare was a big one, immigration was a big one, abortion came up, climate change, democracy, and the problem with crime. Those were the major issues that were discussed in that debate. And it's maybe, and we're all wondering, well, we want to know what the candidates say on those issues. You know what we as believers need to do? We need to figure out what God says on those issues. And then maybe that will inform us how we vote correctly based on those issues. But beyond that, does God have anything to say about crime? Uh, he's against it. Can we just say it that way? Read the Ten Commandments about stealing, about murder. I mean, God's against it, so we understand that. Uh, what about abortion? What about abortion? If you believe that God is the giver of life and He creates life, if you destroy a life, whether it's in the womb or after birth, it's still murder. I, I, I don't know how else you can interpret the Scripture literally come to any other conclusion. Now, I know there's those situations that are, you know, uh, uh, that are just awful and dreadful, and I understand that, but... The basic thing is God has something to say about that, uh, about war and peace. Well, God has things to say about that. I'm not to know about the specifics of the particular struggles that are going on. But God does give nations a fundamental, and humans, a fundamental right to self-defense. You see that in the Old Testament law. Okay, so that's, that's a reality. Uh, uh, democracy. Uh, the form of government we have uh, that people have lived under have run from A to Z, from monarchy to democracy to totalitarian dictators, all that sort of thing. But I, I do believe this, that we should support a system that gives us the greatest freedom for us to do what God calls Christians to do. That's, you know, I, I don't want to live under a communist regime like it is in China where the church is repressed and suppressed. I would prefer to live under a, under a system by which we have freedom. And Paul talks about this when he writes Timothy. He says, pray for those in our leaders that we may lead quiet and peaceable lives for the, ostensibly for the reason that we want to be able to share the gospel with people. Not that we care about the political system in and of itself, but a political system that gives us freedom to do what God calls us to do. So you and I, our job is to not live in ignorance, but take input from the word of God so that we're informed about the issues of the day. I want to know what he believes, what she believes, whatever. That's well and good. But you have to start with knowing what we believe. How do we get that? Through a constant diet of the Word of God. And God calls us to make sure that we calculate our actions based on the truth. That indeed we, we, we do these things. Let me just summarize with this. We need to calculate our message of the truth this way. Number one, speak against what is wrong. Speak against what is wrong. Injustice, untruth. The, the desire and the lust for power, greed, abuse, on and on it goes. Those things that are a front to the, to, the, to the character of God himself. We need to speak out and, and do that. Number two, speak out for what is right. Yes, the truth, but speak the truth in love. We don't want to be, just because someone is against the truth does not mean that uh, they are to be hated or they are to be disdained. In some ways, when you really realize it, Pastor Tim spoke, through, spoke from Psalm 73 last Sunday night. I appreciated that message so much. Where, where Asaph talks about, once he realized the wicked were in, in, in such a precarious place before God, he says, when I went into the, went into the temple to God, he basically says, I feel sorry for them. I have compassion for them. All that hatred, all that vitriol, all that, all that abuse and all that ugly stuff is an indication of what? They need Jesus. That's what they need. 
And that's what we need to give. Number three, speak about what is true. And that ultimately comes down to the message that we need to deliver, that I need to deliver, that we collectively need to deliver, you individually need to deliver, you and your family need to deliver, is the gospel. The reality that we are sinners on our way to hell. Jesus is the only Savior, the only remedy for sin, and He paid sin's price by dying on the cross. By dying on the cross, He paid sin's price, and now we receive that gift of salvation by believing in Him and accepting Him as our Savior. I said that very quickly. It's not complicated, but that's the message of the gospel. And if you're here this morning, you're listening into us this morning, and you've never received that message, that's the one message you need to hear, and that's the one message we want to deliver and it's simply this, that we ever and always should just be saved. That Jesus saves. And he wants to save you. And we are what we are by the grace of God, saved by him. Well, you know the rest of the story, I assume. She does go in. He raises his scepter. She, she has a banquet. Haman, the, 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 uh, the, the villain in this whole story, is humiliated. And finally, he's executed on a gallows that he wanted to put Mordecai on. You just got to read the story. It's, a, it's wild. But eventually, now the king can't do anything about the former order, but he gives a counter order. He says the Jews can defend themselves on that day and so forth, and the, the Jews are saved. And they celebrate every March this same holiday because of that great victory of God's deliverance. Because one woman was willing to take a risk. We may not be called on to do anything quite so dramatic, but every day of our lives, God calls upon us to speak up, speak out, speak against what is wrong, and speak about what is true. To willing to be public about our faith, to not be and remain silent, but to speak up for the truth. It's my desire that we will pursue that. We will practice that. And God will be pleased as we do. Let's pray.